I'm very pleased to move on to our, our next talk, which is uh, given by Jonathan Kopes, who's on the faculty of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's director of the Gardner Agricultural Policy Program and author of the book, The Fault Lines of Farm Policy, a Legislative and Political History of the Farm Bill. He has served as chief counsel and special counsel for the Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry. He's an administrator of the Farm Service Agency at USDA and legislative assistant to Senator Ben Nelson. Jonathan grew up on his family farm in Western Ohio, earned his bachelor's degree from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and is Juris Doctor from the George Washington University Law School in Washington, DC. Let's welcome Jonathan Kopes. Good morning. Um, I want to congratulate Jim and Matt on their strategic brilliance to have me go first. So you get to start your day with a farm bill discussion. What could be better? The excitement in the room is, is bursting. The other thing I can tell you is, look, you start your day with a farm bill discussion, you start your week with a farm bill discussion, it's all uphill from here. So you got a lot to look forward to, all right? Uh, as Jim said, I'm at the University of Illinois. And uh, I spent some time in the swamp uh, doing uh, farm bill work, loved every last minute of it and have yet to recover. And so I keep working on it, including research uh, into the history of it and trying to think through what policies may uh, be possible in the future. So I'm excited to be here and to talk to this group. Let's get this underway. So what is a farm bill, right? We got to define things. Once upon a time, I went to law school. I think that's important. Uh, in statute, it's important to define things. So let's define out a farm bill. First and foremost, it's multi-year, omnibus. Multi-year, five-year. Typically, uh, we write a farm bill to sunset in five years, which forces Congress to reconsider and reauthorize the programs in a farm bill. The last one was authorized in 2018. So there are expectations and a whole lot of churning going on about reauthorizing in 2023. Hold that thought, we'll come back to it. It's omnibus because it's multiple, multiple issues, multiple uh, provisions within one bill, right? So if we think about an appropriations bill that just appropriates the USDA, that's wouldn't be omnibus, but the farm bill covers roughly 10 to 12, sometimes 15 titles um, and a whole lot of issues within the jurisdiction of the ag committees, agriculture committees. So everything from farm subsidies to conservation, to the supplemental nutrition assistance program, Research, all land-grant universities have uh, the, the authorization for uh, land-grant research universities extension. All of that comes through the Farm Bill trade, some, bio, some renewable energy work, forestry, and a whole bunch more. Uh, so it is omnibus. And finally, it's authorizing legislation. Again, as compared to appropriations, which typically are the funding mechanisms for the federal government and programs, the committees authorize actions. The Farm Bill is relatively unique in that it not just authorizes programs, but it has what we call mandatory spending authority. So when the Ag Committees change law, they can change things that spend. And these are what we typically consider to be entitlement programs. And I'm going to spend most of my time talking about that because those are the drivers of the Farm Bill politics, the drivers of the, the bill and the bulk of the funding. This from the Congressional Research Service just gives you a sense of the spending um, by title in what was the 2018 Farm Bill. It doesn't take uh, even somebody who masquerades in economics to notice that the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program is the largest item in the Farm Bill. Somewhere between 80 to 85 percent of all the funds spent are spent through that program to help low-income individuals and families purchase food and put food on the table when they're struggling environmentally. Within that, we see crop insurance, conservation, and commodities. It's those four titles I'm going to focus on, but I, I don't want to completely leave out everything else. There's a lot more in that bill that, that gets negotiated. But critical to this is it authorizes these actions, it authorizes appropriations, and it directs spending itself. And so the committees in a somewhat unique situation in Congress, which is feeds the politics because they actually do determine where money gets spent and how it gets spent um, within the authorizing committee. And that is somewhat unique, which also means we got to talk budget and we got to talk baseline. So I apologize for that. Take a big, big gulp of coffee coffee, and prep yourself for this. I'm a lawyer. I don't like math either, but budgets and baseline are the single most important political matter in a farm bill process. Let me say that again. Budgets and baseline are the single most important matter. 
In fact, I will argue with anybody in this room and anybody else anywhere else that because of our budget rules, we've changed the way we legislate. We've actually changed our legislative process and we've changed and altered the politics that go into writing legislation like a farm bill. Let me show you why and how. Here again, the Congressional Research Service provides us a wonderful snapshot from 1990 to roughly 2017, 18, about 25, 27 years of what was actually spent by farm bills going all the way back to the 1990 Food, Agriculture, Conservation and Trade Act or the FACT Act of 1990 which by the way, for those of you who like trivia, is the first and only farm bill to have its own global climate change title thus far. Hold that thought. More importantly for a farm bill is what is in the shaded area or the projected outlays. This is what we call the baseline. Every year, the Congressional Budget Office, nonpartisan, non-affiliated economists with no you know, supposed political or partisan skin in the game, estimate what they think the, the programs are gonna spend based on their economic analysis and so on and so forth. And the way the baseline works, it's not reality. You always have to contend with this. It's a wonderful little system. What they say is let's presume the 2018 Farm Bill is extended for 10 years, no changes in the statutory text, no changes in how the programs operate. Then they estimate all their economic uh, forecasts around it, crop prices, yields, so on and so forth, right? It is from that they determine what they think this bill will spend over 10 years. That is the baseline. So we know what it has spent, that's actual outlays by the federal government. This other side is what they forecast spending to be. This is critical because under budget rules, you cannot go above your baseline. It is a zero sum game. If you go above the baseline, you're subject to budget points of order and other problems politically on the floor, and you can lose your bill in a hurry. Why this matters is, if it's zero sum, this is the pie, this is all we have to play with in the committee when it comes to programs and policies. If somebody in this room has a brand new brilliant idea for a conservation program that will help with phosphorus, great. Your first challenge, who gets cut to pay for that program? Because everything new has to be offset. So this baseline is the single driving force and it's the most important component of this discussion. So I apologize for having a baseline and budget discussion this early in the morning, but welcome to farm bills. Everything is torture. Just to give you a sense. So CBO last made this estimate in May of 2022. And this is what I've got on the screen here in front of you. This is their estimate. This will not apply to 2023. They will re-estimate and re-forecast sometime early 2023 and is that baseline that matters for the farm bill. So this is just a rough estimate of that. You can kind of see from 2023 fiscal year to 2032 what they're projecting. This will change. This, this is not what the committees will be stuck with, but the basic parameters will not change. 80 to 85% of the spending will be in the SNAP program. Why? That program helps more than 40 million Americans put food on the table. It is a massive program. Yes, 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 it spends a lot of money, but it spends it on a lot of people and it helps them buy food. And I can't think of too many things more critical for policy to do than that. You can also see the commodity titles, crop insurance, and, title, uh, and, and the conservation title, where I'm gonna focus most of our attention because I imagine those are the policies that everybody cares the most about. Um, by the way, I should have said this earlier. Please, if you have questions or, or something like doesn't make sense, like what kind of gibberish is that fool from Illinois spewing, stop me and ask. I, I'm happy to be interrupted and more than happy to try to sort out whatever doesn't seem to uh, make sense. But these are the four main authorized mandatory spending titles. These are, these are the ones that go out whether appropriators ever get an appropriations bill done or not. I mean, except for that little challenge that if you don't have funding to pay for salaries and expenses at USDA, you can't really operate the programs, but that's a minor issue. Focus on conservation. Okay. There are a host of, it's like an alphabet soup of acronyms. So give, give me a chance to walk through this a little bit. There is at the top, Regional Conservation Partnership Program created in 2014's Farm Bill, Agriculture Conservation Easement Program, like its name, it applies agricultural conservation easements to land. So things like a wetlands, retain, maintain or restore wetlands. And it's a permanent legal interest on that land that runs with the land. EQIP is one of the biggest ones that is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Here's where we're making direct cost share assistance to farmers to put practices on their farm with 
in the production operate, right? This is a working lands conservation program. We're not taking acres typically out of production. Usually 50% of this is supposed to go to livestock to help deal with uh, the wonderful manure challenges we have in livestock. CSP, Conservation Security Program from 2002, now the Conservation Stewardship Program. There are two versions of that. I will not trouble you with that wonderful uh, bit of trivia. It was changed in 2018. This one is a five-year annual contract with the farmer. The idea is you're supposed to be doing enough conservation to qualify for the payments. And then every year for five years, you're under contract to do more. You're supposed to expand, improve, and, and do better conservation across your whole farm. Uh, wonderful set of challenges for, for this program and some great history, even in the last 20 years of this, about how it has uh, maybe not met its potential. And then finally, there is the legacy program within conservation. This is a conservation reserve program, the CRP. Traditional, traditional conservation. 10 to 15 year contracts, we're renting those acres out of production. We put them under uh, you know, cover, uh, uh, permanent grass cover, some places trees. Usually uh, for highly erodible or sensitive farmland, we want out of production or shouldn't be in production. And that, is, that program has a long legacy as well. From the commodity, and I don't, I don't want to torture you with too much of this. From the subsidy side of this in Title I, this is the political engine, even if it's not the biggest item of spending, and it's certainly not the biggest constituency base in the world or within the farm bill, but it's the engine. Here's where the farm commodity groups get into their sort of tussle, uh, their political battling over who gets what and how they get that money through either the price loss coverage program, fixed prices, trigger payments, agriculture risk coverage, or ARC, revenue-based prices and yields on a historic basis. Dairy and disaster are the largest items in that. And what you will notice between these two is the Title I programs fluctuate quite a bit. This is that baseline impact. So if CBO says prices are going to go through the roof, we're not going to trigger payments, that baseline collapse. The committees do not get any of that savings. They do not get to count that as like, oh, I got an extra $10 billion to spend. It's not how it works. Same thing on the other side of the coin. If prices collapse and these things start kicking out massive payments, Committees do not have to pay for that. That is just built into the baseline. And if that happens, that's just part of the, the, the item of spending. It also is an important way to think about how policies are designed. These sort of counter cyclical things have value when you're fighting through baseline issues. And I can talk through that more if we ever want to torture ourselves with that. Okay. Now, normally this conversation, you know, I could we could spend a lot of time talking through the alphabet soups and programs. But things change drastically in August, and I want to kind of go over why and sort of tee this up a little bit for your thinking about future farm bills and policy. So the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, I presume everybody's heard about this, hundreds of billions of dollars investment in efforts to combat climate change. Tucked within that is about $35 billion from the Ag Committees. Tucked within that $35 billion is roughly $18 billion for conservation. This is historic if you, if you think about farm bills. We've never seen Congress make an outside the farm bill infusion or investment of funding into conservation policies in this way. So this is a pretty big deal because it adds additional money. Now I gotta be careful if there's any economists in the room, you'll recognize that this chart has things to be questioned. Fair enough. Uh, again, it's more illustrative than it is you know, direct data. Part of the problem is CBO estimates those baseline spending items and the solid bars like we, we saw earlier. The Inflation Reduction Act bars are on top of that. Those are appropriated dollars so that they set up a four-year appropriation that builds each year, as you can see. And those funds are available to 2031. So there are different funding streams. There are different ways in which that money goes out. If you think about it, it's basically two lines of cash coming in, two lines of investment coming into conservation policy, one from the Inflation Reduction Act, one from the Farm Bill. But this is historic. This is a big potential change. It could drive uh, the change in politics around the Farm Bill. One, because of additional funding. We have not seen Congress put that money into conservation. I want to say that again, before and outside of Farm Bill. Oftentimes we'll see them do things like disaster assistance and the previous administration did a lot with disaster, not even disaster, but made up programs. Um, we've never seen Congress step in and say, we have got to invest in conservation and climate change the way they did in the Inflation Reduction Act. That's reason number one. Reason number two, this bill is really, really important. And I know you probably can't see some of this and I apologize, don't worry, it's just statutory sites. Nobody likes that but me. Um, 
the other reason why this is important in terms of the Farm Bill, why the Inflation Reduction Act really it matters in the sort of political game, if you will, of the Farm Bill. Remember how I said the 2018 Farm Bill is scheduled to expire in 2023, not conservation. Because of all the weird dynamics and doing budget reconciliation for the Inflation Reduction Act, every conservation program has been extended through 2031. This is huge. In the game of politics, this is a big sort of negotiating leverage for conservation. This allows conservation interests and programs a little bit of breathing room, more money, longer time frame of authorization. Right now, the programs that expire next year are the subsidy programs, as well as some of the trade assistance and some of the other things that do not have permanent mandatory funding. If Congress did nothing next year, conservation continues to 2031, crop insurance continues, and the SNAP program continues. It's a fascinating dynamic that we're still trying to wrap our heads around. Okay, that is a good point for me to take a moment and see if there are questions before I drag you through history and try to make absolutely no sense out of conservation whatsoever. Well, you guys pull me, tell me to get off the stage when you're, when you're, ready, when you're ready to move on. I know we're a little bit behind. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> that was quick, by the way, and now I'm nervous. Yes. <laughs> Very good question. And I thought I had that in there somewhere, and I may still. So I apologize. The, the, the third thing the Inflation Reduction Act did, so more money into conservation title, extended the authorization, and directed that those funds, that additional bump up above the baseline, is for climate change based practices. Things that, that the secretary, the, the practices they have determined or will determine have some impact on reducing losses, reducing emissions, or capturing and storing in some form or fashion. Greenhouse gas. So yes, that is climate change based funding through the conservation title, which potentially sets up, you know, a redirection in some of that conservation thinking. There's a lot of practices that get funded. There's a lot of debate about which ones are worth funding. And this could push some of that. Yeah, somebody else. Sorry. I was about to get into that. Is that, the easy that is not an easy question because it's a different funding stream. So it doesn't build baseline. It would have to be repurposed. You'd have to take some of that funding and redirect it or repurpose it somewhere else, which opens up a whole wonderful political uh, uh, strategy and gamesmanship around, okay, if we cut the new funds for EQIP, where do they go? And how do they spend and how will CBO estimate it out over 10 years? So it is possible to do that. This, that's why this is a potentially big issue that it provides additional funding for new ideas and programs that wouldn't normally have been there. Now, you, you will butt heads with those who see, you know, the existing alphabet soup is getting those funds and not wanting to redirect it, but it's a negotiation. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I believe EQIP money is capped at $300,000 per farmer. Is that going to change? The and payment increase? limits shouldn't change on those programs. The, the cap's not going to change? Uh, so I want to be careful about caps. These are payment limits. The payment which, limits, yeah are somewhat functional and can be worked around if needed. So you will find situations where those do not hit the way they, they may be intended in the statute, but the, the payment limitation should continue. Second question, is USDA SBIR money part of Farm Bill or separate? SBIR money? Small business initiative for research? Uh, that should be in the rule development title of the Farm Bill if it's authorized through through the bill. Um, I was, I was thinking SBIR was all state-based, but, um, I'd have to double check for certain whether that's in the, in the rule, if it's anywhere, it's in title six rural development title. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to note all that money is for working land programs, right? All of that money is for working lands programs. Yes. Well, so, excuse me. Sorry. The, it, there are, there is an additional amount of funding for the easement programs and those are not. Typically, I mean, those can be a wetlands within working right, lands. Right, but the the bulk of the money is not for land retirement programs. Correct. Not and CRP the, did not get any funding through this. So, and the practices that equip and CSP fund tend to be a often non additional and certainly not permanent. So, uh, I 
I personally was not happy to see that money because <laughs> we're throwing good money after bad uh, when it comes to climate solution. If we're, it, you know, you can put 15 layers of band-aids, but if you have cancer, it ain't gonna do anything for it. So I think that's a very important part of the debate, and I understand your position. I, I put this into a longer time frame and and sort of my understanding of the politics of a farm bill. And in that case, I, I see it differently. I see it as investments that, again, we spend money on things like farm program payments that may themselves be more problematic. And so whether it's Band-Aids on a cancer patient, you know, I think I think there's value in trying to move this along and invest in these practices and make progress where we can. I certainly hear you and agree that this is this is this isn't the answer. But I will say from from a historical perspective and from the politics of this legislation, this is a big move. And additionality and other questions I also understand are problematic. Permanence you know, I hear that as well. If we're reducing losses, that's a step in the right direction. If we're improving practices on the ground, that's steps in the right direction. Whether or not that's going to solve this issue, no. I mean, farm agriculture and climate change is not going to be solved by $18 billion in a farm bill. Steps in the right direction are important, and they're important in pushing the politics in the direction it needs to go. That's how I look at it. It's a great point, though. All right. How much? Uh, how much history do you want to go through? Because, I mean, this is where you Oh, you guys. Oh, Jim said that. Just know. Just know. History. As everybody should know, the Farm Bill is rooted in the New Deal. Right? This is Great Depression, Depression era sort of roots. The first Farm Bill, May 13th, 1933, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. This is just a picture of the, you know, bankrupt farmers being uh, auctioned off and some of the challenges that go through it. If I had one picture for the history of the Farm Bill, it would be this. And this is an unfair, again, economists in the room, bear with me. This is not to scale. This is only 300 million acres to 400 million acres. It's exaggerated for points, again, illustrative more than anything. What this is, is what USDA has reported are the total cropland acres used to produce crops in this country and the fluctuations. I think this is a pretty fascinating perspective on it. And we can talk about how policy decisions and other things have driven this. So the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, 1936 Soil Conservation Domestic Allotment Act was a huge, well, maybe not so big. It was at least an attempt to do some conservation in the middle of the Dust Bowl. The Great Depression and a Supreme Court case won out. But what I want to focus on is the fact that we increased acres leading into the Depression. We increased acres as farmers were in a depressed state after World War I. We'd increased acres in World War I during the World War I era to combat, you know, uh, wheat was going to win the war. We did that mostly in the Western Plains, High Plains, Southern Plains, where you put into wheat production that became in a drought scenario the Dust Bowl challenges. But 1936 was kind of our first sort of shot at conservation. It didn't last long and it didn't do much, largely because the depression and other issues got in the way. Our next sort of peak is post-Korean War in the 1950s. This is also post-World War II and this technological so-called revolution in agriculture where we start to adopt synthetic fertilizers, we start to adopt uh, the chemicals and some of the other uh, scientific and advancements from wartime uh, uh, research and, and, and undertakings. Again, we, we expand acres. Again, we run into problems in the farm economy. This time we're talking about massive surpluses that are forfeited over the federal government under existing farm policies and failed policy. But in 1956, the Eisenhower administration pushed Congress to implement what it called the soil bank. Its idea being, we got too many acres, we're producing too much on those acres, let's shift some of those into conservation. Every year, let's make a, a, a shift into conservation if we don't need all the wheat acres or all the cotton acres. Um, over time, it created the first conservation reserve program to try to do that, that move acreage out of production that's not needed. That program was sabotaged uh, in Congress, largely by uh, 
some of our good friends from the southern part of the country, including Jamie Witten, who was a powerful chairman of the Appropriations Committee, helped bring that policy down. So conservation's kind of 0 for 2 after the 1950s. We started in 36, not so much. We tried again in 56, tore apart. Oh, trivia moment. Everybody knows Farm Aid 1985. Does everybody know where the first Farm Aid concert was? No, Memorial Stadium, Champaign, Illinois. Come on, I, my trivia is self-serving too, right? I like this, this little thing right here. This gigantic spike in acres after we had pulled all these acres out of production in the 1960s. And by the way, that trough was largely a policy response. It began with the soil bank and then they killed the soil bank and then they kind of recreated part of it and applied it only to corn and wheat for the most part and feed grains. But it, policies pulling those acres out of production. We're paying taxpayer dollars to get those acres out of production. Then the 1970s happened. Three big things. Soviet grain deal cleared out storage of surplus crops. Anchovy harvest fails off of Peru and, so and there's a run on soybeans for protein. And then everybody's favorite Secretary of Agriculture, Earl Butts, tells American farmers to get big, get out, go, go fence row to fence row. Or my favorite line, we have reached the promised land. Anytime somebody tells you you've reached the promised land, go the other way. Unfortunately, Butts pushes production. Congress changes farm policy to also incentivize production. And what do farmers do? You incentivize production. They're going to do so. And so we have this drastic increase of acres that goes all the way into the, great, the farm economic crisis of the 80s. It recreates massive soil erosion problems. Now those soils are eroding with synthetic fertilizers and chemicals on them and with an environmental movement that all of a sudden showed up in the 1970s and pushed Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and so forth. Major accomplishments in a very short amount of time. All that pressure pushes us into the 1985 Farm Bill and what is today the permanent authorizing legislation for conservation programs in the Farm Bill. So think about that. From 1933 to 1985, not so much conservation. 1985 forward, we now have a basic set of conservation programs. 85 is huge. This is the depths of the farm economic crisis. We create the C recreate the CRP, the Conservation Reserve Program, upwards of 40 to 45 million acres authorized. I think the biggest political piece, and this is one of those examples uh, where, where you may disagree with how much it's actually accomplished, but the political undertaking is amazing. In 85, depths of the farm crisis, Congress attached conservation compliance to farm program payments and crop insurance. Crop insurance wasn't quite as big a deal back then. But that was huge. At a point in time when farmers are going bankrupt because of the economic crisis, in part because they were pushed to expand and they expanded using debt. And when they got deeper in debt, Volcker raised the interest rates. And, you know, we know the story. We're living through it again in some senses. Not saying we're repeating the 80s. Please don't take that out of that comment. Um, but we did create conservation compliance. Now your farm subsidy payments, your program payments are contingent on, are conditioned on, if you're farming highly erodible ground, you're taking care of erosion on that ground. If you drain a wetland or farm a drained wetland, you're ineligible. Whether you think a policy does much or not, I just want to stress and emphasize how big of a political shift that was. There was no opposition. I have combed the congressional record for this and there's no opposition. Well, there's like one person. Representative Marlene from Montana was like the lone voice screaming in the wind, don't regulate agriculture. But he was the only, he's basically the only one that really tried to fight this. So in this crisis, we moved a massive political mountain in terms of conservation. Every Farm Bill conservation program is now written as part of the 85 Act. Conservation compliance has largely continued some changes here and there. So it's a big movement. I, again, this is why I think in the historical realm, these sort of shifts can push things in a different direction. And 85 just stands as, as, as landmark uh, legislation. But look, I want to be realistic. We know some of the challenges of agriculture. There's the, lower, there's the Lake Erie Basin issue, dust bowls, erosion, nutrient loss, irrigation challenges. And let's be honest. That's not where we've prioritized our farm bill spending. If you look at this chart, these are government, direct government payments reported by USDA. The red bar is all government payments that are not conservation. The green tops are just conservation. Clearly, throughout the history of these policies, whether we look at the fact that it took till 1985 to get this sort of cemented in the status quo of a farm bill, to the fact we have always invested more money through the economic assistance type program. That's just reality. 
Some of those investments, uh, by the way, the giant spike is the Trump administration's market facilitation program payments that they made up and the coronavirus food assistance programs that were they only made up half of. Largest amount of spending. This is adjusted for inflation by USDA, not me. So these are sort of equivalent across time. Twenty twenty one dollars. So all this leads me to here's some history. Here's some background. What do you think about the 2023 Farm Bill? Uh, my outlook, very cloudy, possibly very treacherous on the edge of those rocks. I don't know. If you can tell me what happens next week about this time, I'll give you one hell of a better idea of what a farm bill is going to look like in 23. Who controls Congress? Who holds the gavels in the ag committees will be the single biggest determinant whether we get anything done next year or not. I'll leave for you to plug in your own political prognostication about how that plays out. Well, that wouldn't be fair, would it? Let's look at some history. Recent history does not give us a warm, happy feeling of Farm Bill success in 2023. So let me just run through the last couple. In 1996, think about this, 94 midterms, Republicans retake the House of Representatives, retake Congress the first time in 40 years. That's 1954, that's pre-Soil Bank, it's Eisenhower. To 1994, Democrats had a run on the House for 40 straight years. 94 flips, first term Clinton. The 96 Farm Bill, written under budget pressures. They use reconciliation process to try to cut the budget, cut the budget, cut spending. Whenever you hear budget being a priority, whenever you hear members of Congress, particularly leadership members, saying we got we to get government spending under control, think budget reconciliation and think highly partisan, dysfunctional, and likely to be counterproductive political debates. 95 is an example of that. Newt Gingrich and the shutdown. 96 Farm Bill did, however, produce massive changes in farm policy in the wake of that. This was decoupling payments, so we no longer paid the farmer based on what they were planting. We paid it on historic acres. It's a bizarre system. I will not torture you with that this morning. Just know that it's, it was a big change. It also was challenging. Following on that was a collapse in prices and billions of dollars of ad hoc assistance. Then the 2002 Farm Bill, the only Farm Bill since the budget regime came into place in which we were given additional funding by the budget committees, 74 plus billion dollars was, was provided for the Farm Bill in 2001 for 2002. We spent about, well, 75% of that on subsidies. Farm programs got the bulk of that funding. However, the Conservation Security Program, the precursor CSP was created by Congress in 2002 and a, a small bump up in funding. It was, however, limited subsequently by appropriators in a sort of echo of 1956. 2008, not much to talk about. RFS, prices are good. Farm bill is pretty much status quo. Then we get into the next two challenges. And this is historically unprecedented, if you like that term. 2014 farm bill, full disclosure, that's the one I lived through. Again, midterms, flip house. House Republicans, this time it was a Tea Party wave in 2002, and the whole focus is what? Cutting spending, cutting the budget. This time we use the debt ceiling as a hostage to negotiate or force spending cuts. The Farm Bill gets into a spending cut fight. In June of 2013, in a highly partisan, highly controversial, really difficult to live through and watch fight over the SNAP program in which they tried to attach very controversial work requirements to the food assistance to low-income individuals and households, the House of Representatives voted down a farm bill for the first time since 1962. The food stamp program, which is the precursor to SNAP, was created in 1964, authorized. 2014, they finally get it through. 2018, you think we learn a lesson? Nope. 2018, we come back at it. This time, Chairman Conaway and the House Ag Committee decides that the partisan fight in 2014 wasn't good enough on the floor. Let's have it in the committee. Same deal. No Democrats vote for it. It gets voted down on the House floor again, the second time in a row, the only time in history that's happened. Now, listen, it was held hostage that time by a right wing faction that wanted immigration votes. So it wasn't specifically a farm bill fight, but the fight over SNAP destroyed the coalition. No Democrats voted for it. Nobody on the far right wanted to vote for all the spending. Thus, there's no coalition. First and last rule of legislation is count your votes. Do you have 218 in the House? Do you have 60 in the Senate? Can you get a bill through the chambers? When this coalition is tore apart by usually almost always budget pressures, there's no path forward, plain and simple. There's your first clue of what's going to happen in 2023. 
I don't know what to make if we go after SNAP again next year and this vital coalition between farm interests and food interests is torn asunder. I don't know what that means for the future. I can pretty much bet money that you can't get farm bills through Congress. You can't get farm subsidy programs through Congress without SNAP. I also think it's counterproductive if we're producing food uh, to take away assistance to buy food, but that's me. Unprecedented payments leading up to this, the market facilitation program, I've already hit on that. Compared to what the programs create, there it is. I knew I had it in there. There's my climate change text, not mine. There's the climate change text in the, in the Inflation, Redu Inflation Reduction Act and that additional spending. The outlook continues. You tell me where we're headed, I don't know. Probably into tough waters. My last bit of food for thought. I told you the baseline is a big driver and you got to find funding. I'm not saying, nobody say that this was my recommendation. This is not my recommendation. But if you're creative, there's about $75 billion over 10 years, just between ARC, the revenue program, price loss coverage, EQIP, RCPP, and CSP. It isn't that there isn't funding. It is that it's divided up in the baseline and spoken for and protected under the status quo protections of the farm bill process and this baseline issue. But should you need food for thought, there is funding there available. This doesn't even count the Inflation Reduction Act dollars. Thank you for suffering through that. Any further questions? I have one question from the European perspective. Uh-oh. Uh, it's Cap, <laughs> the... Uh, it means that whenever budget cuts prevail, they also extend to agricultural funding. Yes. Which would not be the case in, in Europe, because in Europe, the conservatives uh, will, would never cut the uh, agricultural budgets. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Here, the, we have this odd, with our two-party dynamic, we have these sort of spectrum. On the far right, they, don't, not, they want to cut budgets largely to, get rid of all of this, including farm subsidies, including to some degree crop insurance premium subsidies. So it is a kind of across the board set of cuts. They know that the big item is SNAP. You attack that, you sort of lose the coalition, then you can get everything else. I'm not making that, I'm not making any political. I'm just, I'm thinking the, polit the budget stuff has changed legislating and changed politics, and that's tough. And I don't think we fully appreciate or understand that always. And how someone votes, well, just vote. That's the only, Could that's the only thing I'll say. Yes, sir. Oh, Sorry. Hey, could you go back just a few slides to your little quote from the Inflation Reduction Act? It oh, yes. Had carbon, nitrogen, but is phosphorus mentioned in the carbon uh, or the Inflation Reduction Act? Uh, I see a lot of nitrogen and carbon. I there, see nitrogen, but... carbon, no. Oh, okay. All right. I mean, emissions and losses should cover more than nitrogen. Yeah, but any idea how nitrogen got in there explicitly? Just because it's a greenhouse gas. I Nitrogen guess. oxide. I mean, we are like leaving the 500,000 pound cow out of the equation here because we can talk about the farm bill till the cows come home, but confined animal feeding operations cause directly or indirectly most of the greenhouse gas emissions in our agricultural system. And Technically, the Clean Water Act considers confined animal feeding operations point sources. So it ain't just the carrot. We also have sticks. You are correct. Clean Water Act includes CAFOs as, as a point source. Um, the Farm Bill EQIP, for example, doesn't try does invest money to attempt to help those farmers meet regulatory requirements or avoid regulatory about half of the funding goes to that in the same vein of this additional funding through the inflation reduction act would look at trying to reduce emissions from livestock and animal agriculture understanding that the funding is limited and the challenge is not thank you for your attention to that uh, discussion and i look forward to the rest of it I'll get out of your way now.